You're listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network. Broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. All Hit Radio. To the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the X Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and for the next four hours, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the X-Zone. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And the X-Zone comes to you, the members of the Worldwide X-Zone Nation, Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight, right here on the X-Zone Broadcast Network. Worldwide toll-free, 800-610-7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, xzoneradiotv. And our radio website, where you can listen to the Xzone 24-7, 365, as well as the live show at www.xzoneradiotv.com. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Elizabeth Kaler Pentecoff. She is the author of The Missing Kennedy. Now, throughout her childhood, Elizabeth frequently visited Rosemary Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy's sister. Why? Well, because Elizabeth's aunt, Sister Paulus Kaler, a Franciscan nun, was Rosemary's devoted caregiver at Kalita in uh, at St. Kalita in Jefferson, Wisconsin for 15 years and her driver and travel companion for over 30 years. The Missing Kennedy chronicles Rosie's life along with that of the author's aunt and delves into the similarities between the two families. It includes many never-before-seen private photos, Kennedy quotes from the author's interviews, and anecdotes about Rosemary and her famous family. Joining me now is Elizabeth Kaler Pendikoff. And Elizabeth, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. Um, when you visited Rosie as a child, did you realize the family's importance to the American public? Not right away. I was quite young when I met Rosie. I was four in 1962, mm-hmm. and she would have been 43. And then as I grew older... I did realize who she was. I think my first realization came with that tragic uh, day when anybody who was alive remembers where they were when Kennedy was shot. And I think, you know, when I learned that our president was assassinated, uh, you know, I knew then that, um, you know, this this woman had a very special uh, place in history. Tell me, what was it about your own life that inspired you to write Rosemary's Story? Like, what took you so long to decide to do it? And I believe it was <laughs> nine years after Rosemary's death. Yes, you're right. Um, many people are, are wondering the same yeah. thing. Um, of course, while she was alive, we all had security concerns. Mm-hmm. I, you know, We didn't want to put any more emphasis on where she was. Some people in the state of Wisconsin knew, 
and they were respectful of her, but um, we still were concerned. And then after she died, it really wasn't something high on my radar. I was caring for my own elderly father at the time, right? and um, so I just didn't really think about it. And then once he passed away, of course, I finally did have time to look back through my photo albums mm-hmm. and enjoy my memories. And one day, uh, since I'm a writer anyways, I, I, I believe in the power of our nighttime dreams. Mm-hmm. And I've actually been in a dream group for many years. I've written a dream journal, I, I think, most of my life. And so um, I decided I wanted to access my subconscious. So one night I said to the universe, okay, I need to know what my next writing project will be. You know, uh, tell me what, what I should work on. And I just left it open and went to sleep. And quite frequently it takes me, oh, maybe even three nights to get an answer to any of my questions that I ask. But this time it, it came, it was right there. And I dreamt that I met a, a young man. He was, he was blonde. And he looked vaguely familiar, but mm-hmm. not really familiar. And he just said, you're going to write The Missing Kennedy. And I said, there is no way. I can't do this. And he said, why? And I said, I don't want to upset anybody on this side of the earth or Mm -hmm. the other. And I think that Eunice will have some issues with this. Now, Eunice, I'm referring to as Eunice Kennedy Shriver, who was Rosie's closest sibling. And he said, no, no, no. He says, actually, they're going to be very happy you wrote this book because of the way you're going to write it. So I, you know, woke up and I thought about that, and it took me a while to actually come to grips with being able to write this because in my own life I was always told to keep secrets. And so it's only natural that when one starts opening up about one's life, Mm -hmm. all that repression and, and, you know, angst comes back. Um, but finally, I decided the best way to start was to interview Anthony Shriver, who was Eunice's, uh, one of Eunice's son, and he began Best Buddies, which is an organization which uh, matches um, disabled, mentally challenged people with um, uh, people who are not disabled. And um, Anthony was very much, very, very close to his Aunt Rosie, he visited her through her life, and uh, so my parents knew Anthony, and I thought, well, if Anthony can approve, then I think I can go forward. Well, he was very enthusiastic about the book, so that's when I began my, my, my writing assignment. What was President Kennedy's sister doing in a home? Why wasn't she right. with the president? Exactly. It's an excellent question, and first of all, Rosemary was born in 1918 Mm -hmm. in an era where not much was known about anybody who perhaps had a learning disability or who was not as academic as the rest of the world. And so when she was born, um, the doctors um, diagnosed her at a young age when she was in kindergarten and and could not pass kindergarten. Um, Parents had asked to hold her back for yet a third year, and the uh, officials at her school said, you know, she really can't be advanced. And so they, Rose and Joe, Rosemary's parents, mm-hmm. took her to see uh, uh, doctors, and they informed the parents that she was mentally retarded. Well, in those days, you know, that's what it was called. Today we'd say mentally challenged, yes. but really... I've seen her schoolwork, mm-hmm. uh, and she was very much able to do her math. She could add three three-digit numbers. Uh, she, she was quite able in, in many of her subjects. The problem she had was with reading and writing, and she did a lot of switching her letters, backward letters, and that's very traditionally known as a learning disability. So it is thought that she probably had learning disabilities. She grew and uh, was educated by the family in a combination of private schools um, and through family tutoring. Uh, 
Uh, and then when she was a teenager, she began exhibiting uh, symptoms of mental illness. Did I, did I read somewhere that um, she actually had a lobotomy? Yes. When she was in her teens, she started uh, portraying like violent tendencies. Mm -hmm. She'd have temper tantrums and she'd, th you know, reach out to people and harm others and herself. And so the family didn't know what to do. Back then, there were no drugs available to help people with depression or right. agitated depression, as she was diagnosed with. And so doctors said, well, you really, the best thing for them is to institutionalize anyone um, with a mental illness, and um, please don't visit them because it's too emotionally traumatic for them. And the Kennedys were not, um, they didn't like this diagnosis, and they didn't like the idea of putting their daughter away. And so Joseph decided to research this more, uh, more, and he found lots of articles mm -hmm. in Reader's Digest, Saturday Evening Post, Time Magazine, newspapers, and they all were touting this brand new surgery that had come to America, and it was called the lobotomy. At the time, Dr. Walter Freeman and his partner, Dr. Watts, uh, did the, the procedure, and Dr. Freeman did a really good job of publicity. He forgot his errors, he swept them under the rug, and he operated at first just on people in mental institutions. And many times these people were cast off and they were not visited, so families lost track of them. Oh my gosh. Uh, they were criminals. Sometimes he, he went to prisons and he operated on people in prisons because they had no one to fight for them. And so any of his errors were conveniently forgotten. And he touted himself to these magazines so that everybody bought his story. And doctors, of course, didn't talk bad about other doctors, so nobody said anything when all these scientific errors were in there, and it was just accepted in society. So Joe went to the best, which he thought was, was the best, and he visited Dr. Freeman with Rosemary, mm -hmm. and uh, so she was lobotomized when she was 23 in 1941, and the family did not know. Oh, my God. As a previously published author and the niece of Rosemary's care, uh, caretaker, now you're, you're qualified to tell this story. How do you think other accounts of the Kennedy family, uh, you know, treat Rosie? Uh, are they accurate accounts in relation to your own experiences? Well, they never knew Rosie after her lobotomy. No way. And a lot of what has been published is not completely accurate. And part of that is because information isn't available. Right. Rosemary does have privacy concerns, even now. I think we're gifted in that we do have so many presidential libraries afforded us, and the John F. Kennedy Library is a magnificent library and museum in Boston. However, when you think of a presidential library, really... The only thing that's required are the papers of the president that the information there that's taken place during the presidency. So in, you know, this center, graciously, uh, the family allowed not numerous papers of their own family life to be included, which is above and beyond what a presidential library really needs to hold, so that some of these information things that I, mm -hmm. people were seeking are blacked out and are unavailable. So that's part of the reason. Uh, the other reason is that the family, uh, you know, basically tried to um, prevent the mental illness stigma from sticking to Rosemary. She does have privacy rights. Mm -hmm. And so they glossed over it. Mrs. Kennedy um, did not even refer to the lobotomy uh, outright in her memoir, and um, a lot of the cases were 
that people just thought Rosemary was teaching. Uh, that, that came up a lot in the research that I did. Oh, Rosemary was a teacher. Rosemary um, loved art. Rosemary uh, liked to travel. But nothing was pinned down about Rosemary exactly where she was. And, and in fact, she was institutionalized. However, in 1961, in December, Joseph Kennedy had a pretty disastrous stroke, which rendered him unable to communicate and unable to walk. And at this point, when the nuns of St. Coletta could no longer contact Joe uh, with regard to Rosemary, they then reached out to Rose. And so this is when Rose and the rest of her family discovered that their Rosie had a lobotomy and she was living in Wisconsin. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is the author of The Missing Kennedy. My guest is Elizabeth Kaler Pentecost. And uh, you can get a copy of this great book by going to missingkennedy.com. And you can also visit uh, Elizabeth's other website at lizbooks.com. Now, you mentioned the research that you did. Did this research change your view of the Kennedy family? I think it's, it did in a way mm -hmm. that when I was growing up, I could not help but be judgmental toward the family in some ways. Although they were, they were very wonderful to my aunt. Um, they, you know, the family was wonderful in that they took this very horrible tragedy that occurred in their family mm -hmm. and really worked for changes in, in the disability movement. Um, you know, they've done so much. Special Olympics, Best Buddies, tons of legislation that Jack, Bobby, and Ted uh, worked through to help for equality and a good health care. However, I always just felt really bad for Rosemary, and how could they um, just kind of ignore a, a, a yeah. big part of her life, and how could that be? But as I researched and discovered how society reacted to people with mental illness, how they just threw them away in institutions that were understaffed and often staffed with uh, criminals because there was no database to check to see if an abuser was uh, working in one facility, mm -hmm. perhaps fired, and then worked yeah. at another. Um, so I came to realize um, an empathy for anybody who's going through this, whether they were the Kennedys or anyone. And then, of course, I had to confront the mental illness in my own family. How do you expect the millions of Kennedy fans, how do, you, how do you think they're going to receive this book? Do you think they'll be interested? I believe so, because I believe that the Kennedys are a very special family mm -hmm. through history. It's almost as though there are royalty. Well, there also and, a very there's also a lot of controversy about oh, the absolutely. the legality concerned with the Kennedys, the assassination of JFK, the assassination of Bobby, and then the shady yes. part of Joe himself. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. And you know, I won't pretend to deny any of it, but I dealt with only mm -hmm. Rosemary and what the Kennedys have done with their misfortune of Rosemary. You know, when I wrote this book, I thought, how am I going to write this? Because it's so comprehensive. Yeah. And then I realized that my aunt, Sister Paulus, was a very unique, extraordinary person. She, too, was of a large Catholic family, like Rosemary. Mm -hmm. But in her Catholic family, they were very poor and rural. And she, was, she also was grew up with a lot of Catholicism and just felt that serving God was her purpose. And through her, the way she related to Rosie, mm -hmm. I saw how she met her eyes, and she said to me, look at her eyes. She can communicate in many ways besides verbally. She can communicate with her eyes. And I saw that my aunt reacted to Rosie not with anger when Rosie didn't want to do something, mm -hmm. but she would place her hand on Rosie's and talk softly and said, Oh, Rosie, I know how well you can listen to me and how you can help turn off the TV, and we can go into your bedroom and get ready for bed together. 
and, you know, do things like that. And so I saw love. And so the way I approached this book was through positive uh, feelings and love, the way my aunt would have written it. You know, there's still a lot of abuse going on in mental institutions and hospitals around yes. the world. In fact, five or six years ago, oh my gosh, it's going back to 2004, 10 years ago, we were responsible for breaking the the news to the world, which brought in the U.S. Department of Justice, the Canadian Minister of Justice, because our show is in Canada, they, the... the um, the U.S. Department of Justice requested that the Canadian Minister of Justice contact us to get copies of our tapes pertaining to the Napa State Hospital in which we we had an inmate call us, a patient call us from a wow. hospital line. And he told us about sex abuse, alcoholism, drugs, and even assaults that were going on there and he yes. couldn't get anyone to listen to them oh it, isn't that marvelous that he reached out to you can you imagine that here because, the, here this guy is in napa state yes. in california we're up here in hamilton ontario he heard the show somehow he right. got a hold of the 800 number and he called us his name is wayne morin jr well wayne is very brave he is he is and, you know the thing is is I'm sure that this is just the tip yep. of the, the, the iceberg here. Um, and the problem with it is, is not only in mental institutions, mm -hmm. but, you know, one-third of everybody that's homeless yeah. has, it has mental illness. Exactly. And, you know, so we've got a big homeless population. And then the largest institution we have in mm -hmm. our country for the mentally ill is in prison. Yes. And prison guards are not trained in mental health concerns. And so, I mean, and you can't blame them if they're not given the abilities, the training, mm -hmm. and the resources that they need. You know, abuses happen. Well, and abuses even happen with the president, uh, uh, you know, of the American Psychiatric Foundation or Association and the Canadian, Dr. Ed, uh, Ewan Cameron, going back to the 50s, early 60s, who was responsible for assisting the CIA in mental institutions and hospitals in Canada and the United States to test them with sleep, uh, sleep deprivation, let me see, yeah. um, uh, LSD, depatterning. Yeah. So who do you trust Absolutely. when it comes to the poor? I know. You know, it's, it's a crime. Yes, yes. We have to, we really have to be vigilant yes. because... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned most with those who have no one visiting them and no one to look into this, yeah. you know, because if everybody has a family that's supportive and can be there, then you do have vocal opposition. But a lot of these people are mm -hmm. no longer um, involved with their families and yeah. communities. So just it's just horrible. And, and we are trying to uh, – we have a senator – in um, the United States, who a congressman who's dealing with this, and he has put forth um, some legislation mm -hmm. that is being kicked around right now in our Congress, and we're hoping that it passes because it again is starting to, uh, you know, really strike down and and enforce some of these things that need to be enforced that are just. They're leading it to the the states in yeah. our country, and the states are just, they have no, they're not equipped to deal with it. So we're just, we really have to be work. We have to write letters. We have to call our, our authorities, yes. like Wayne did, mm -hmm. and uh, report these abuses to journalists yeah. like you and newspapers so that there can be stories on it. If indeed this is the first and only book on on Rosemary, why? Why is this the first book? Is it the first well, book? Well, there, there's another book that talks more about her, her past life, her, mm -hmm. her early life that just came out. And um, there is a book now, Patrick Kennedy has a new book, that he is the first family member uh, to write a book and admit that Rosie had mental illness 
And I think that is very brave of Patrick. And I think perhaps because he suffers from mental illness, Mm -hmm. he certainly can relate and realize that there should not be stigma to mental illness. We should be treating mental illness just like we do physical illness. It should be equal. When we go to the doctor, not only should they take our blood pressure and ask us about our diet, but they should be talking about our mental health, our stress, what's happening, what's going on, and they need to know how to read between the lines. And I think that no one's written about rosemary before Mm -hmm. because, like I said, part of it is lack of information, and part of it is look who look who she's uh, up against in her famous family. Mm-hmm. Her other people, I mean, Robert and Ted and um, Jack and Eunice, I mean, they're quite fascinating people in their own right. They've done quite a bit. And like you said, there's a lot of controversy with every one of yeah. the Kennedys. So uh, what sells books? Controversy. Sure does. You know, I also think that teachers should also be taking the the necessary courses so that they can help detect any problems at an early age and instead of Absolutely. just putting a child on ritalin or any of these other psychopa- psychotropic drugs that they get the help and the attention that they deserve yes when i was in school mm-hmm. i one of my degrees is is in education and right. i was a teacher and of course i was uh, in school back in the late 70s the only class that we were required to take was one where we talked about all health, and I believe mental health was not mentioned in a mental illness sort mm-hmm. of way, but we were able to visit a special school with children with developmental and physical disabilities. And that was one day, and that was it. That's it. One day. That was it. In 1978 and 79, yes. Let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. How come there are certain groups that get attention? There are certain groups that the medical community and society will look at. And yet when it comes to mental challenges of any kind, it's a dark, dirty sociological mm-hmm. secret. We keep them in the closets. Right. Why? Well, partly it's a carryover from the old days. You know, uh, my family mm-hmm. suffered from, uh, my, my mother's family had, um, she had several siblings. One was schizophrenic. Mm-hmm. Uh, several were d- depressed. Right. And we had no idea what was going on. We were clue. It was clu- We were clueless. We didn't know what was wrong. When, when my uh, aunt would suffer uh, horrible, uh, horrible episodes, I would ask my mom, I'd say, what's wrong with her? Mm-hmm. And my mother would point to her head and tap it, and she'd say, something's wrong up here. But that's all we knew. Yeah. And it wasn't until I grew up and started reading about mental illness, and then I was able to access some things, that I realized what was going on with my own family. And so... That's part of it, is the carryover and how well we've been taught to maintain secrets. The other thing is that it's not a sexy disease. And, you know, it's, it needs to come out of the closet. Exactly. And we need to have more people, more famous people, more celebrities mm-hmm. adopted as a cause. Um, you know, we've, we've got lots of very important celebrities, and they're doing doing their bit because they do support good causes. Sure. But we still need, you know, Glenn Close has a wonderful organization which she talks about mental illness. But I think we need more behind her. We need a, a bigger effort. I'm hoping Patrick Kennedy's effort will catch on and more people will react. We need a revolution is what we need. I'm going to get... I'm, I'm putting my foot in my mouth with this next statement and I know I'm going to get nailed by animal lovers from around the world but the way I see Uh oh me too but go ahead and say it (laughs) Okay, I love animals I really do I I love animals and I must tell you that one of the consulting jobs that Relmar McConnell Media Company took was to assist the SBCA 
And, and we did a great job. We brought a lot of attention to the work of the inspectors and the enforcement branch. However, having had that experience and then working with the International Institute for Spinal Regeneration, where doctors and researchers were trying to raise money to get people to walk again, it's easier to raise money for animals than it is to raise money for people. And that's a fact of life, and I find that perplexing. I really do. If I wanted right. to raise money for the SBCA, all I had to do was take a pup, bring it down to a TV station, have an inspector hold the puppy up, and we would get donations left, right, and center. Take the same scenario we with, with people in wheelchairs Right. Doctors, professors who, who are asking for assistance to get the money that it would take to take the, the research that they've, that they've developed and worked so hard on into the, into the clinical trial stages, forget it. I know. It's not a cute disease. You know, it's not a puppy is cute and it strikes all of us. It, it, just, it just makes us want to give money when we see a poor defenseless puppy. But you know what? Anyone who has a mental illness yeah. is poor and defenseless, too. Sure, sure, exactly. You know, how many people walk by a person who's homeless on the street and not give them a second glance? Right. They're invisible to society. And they you are. Know, you know what? I, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. I really do, because you are, in a very subtle and yet effective way, letting people know that there's another part of society who need our help as well. Hats off to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. And just know that every single person can make a difference mm -hmm. every day in their lives. I mean, it doesn't take only a famous Kennedy to do it. But, I mean, look at my aunt. She was an extraordinary woman. Right. But she was very ordinary. Mm -hmm. And she was extraordinary in the small, everyday kindnesses that she devoted her entire life to. They're the unsung uh, so heroes. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, sometimes you might not be able to afford to give all your money to, uh, you know, a, a cause. Maybe you can afford to give an hour a week. Exactly. Maybe you can write one letter. Exactly. Maybe you can send somebody a card. Exactly. Um, you know, you show so, me a person who thinks, thinks that money is the answer to everything, and I'll show you a very narrow-minded person and self-centered yeah. person as well. Elizabeth, stand by. You and I have to take a news break. Exo Nation, my guest this hour is Elizabeth Kaler Pentecost. She is the author of The Missing Kennedy. Here's the website, www.missingkennedy.com. And uh, Elizabeth's other website is lizbooks.com. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Send me your emails. Exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And our main radio website where you can listen to the Exxon 724-365 as well as our live broadcast, www.exxonradiotv.com. You know, Exxon Nation, Elizabeth was so right you don't have to give money to make a difference. Give yourself. Make yourself available. Smile. Do something nice for another person. Be part of the solution and not part of the problem. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. Ever wondered if your advertising dollar is really working for you? If your ad would have been here, you and more than 4 million people would be listening to it right now. Contact ads at exxoneradiotv.com.
While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Jeff Gilson didn't go out looking for adventure, danger, or the answers to most of the controversial political intrigues of the past 30 years. But he found all three when he began investigating the mysterious death of his close friend, Margaret Thatcher's favorite speechwriter. Just an ordinary guy living in a small, sleepy suburb 20 miles outside of London, Jeff's questions provoked a powerful response on both sides of the Atlantic. He was shot at, warned off by the CIA, and formed a close bond with one of Israel's most notorious intelligence officers. Relive Jeff's gripping adventure in his fast-paced book, Maggie's Hammer. Peel away the layers of establishment deception and discover, as Jeff did, that his friend was an assassin with British intelligence, that Great Britain has been America's secret hitman for the past 30 years, and that Princess Diana was not the target in that Parisian tunnel. All of this and more when you visit www.maggieshammer.com and find the link to buying this explosive book online. More and more ordinary people feel they no longer have control of their lives. Jeff fought back. He asked the difficult questions. He set out to redesign his own destiny. And you can do the same using Maggie's Hammer as your guide. Don't waste a moment. Buy it today. Visit www.maggieshammer.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings, slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From out of the woodwork will take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. The new non-fiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well, then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, 
you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Welcome back, everyone. My guest this hour is the author of The Missing Kennedy. My guest is Elizabeth Kaler Petikoff. Her website is missingkennedy.com and lizbooks.com. Elizabeth, uh, to what extent have the Kennedy and Shriver families been helpful in writing your book, The Missing Kennedy? Oh, the Shrivers have been very helpful. Um, I only contacted the Shrivers because I felt like Mm -hmm. they were the ones most involved with Rosemary, and they were uh, very, very kind to give uh, good interviews for me, and uh, they've been very supportive. They've given some Mm -hmm. uh, testimonials as well. So they've been very helpful. I, you know, I'm haven't heard from any of the other Kennedys, but, you know, there's no reason for them to contact me because I never really reached out to them. Um, I think that they're doing a, a lot, like I said, with uh, for, for mental um, illnesses now that Patrick has taken the lead, and they're doing uh, a lot for mental disabilities uh, within their, their own programs and through the Joseph uh, P. Kennedy Foundation uh, all of the money that they raise for that foundation is for anyone who uh, research or um, needs uh, assistance with um, the issues of mental disabilities. Tell me, Elizabeth, what do you think your motivation is? You, I, you mentioned something about your own uh, connection to... Uh, Mental illness. Yes, mental illness. Right. I think, you know, the first motivation was empathy. Right. Uh, And I think that, you know, that's still a big part of Mm -hmm. the book and a big part of who my aunt was. Right. I think we all need to remove that stigma that still exists. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but beyond that, I think it's it's become deeper for me because, first of all, I had to face my own uh, demons, so to speak, because I was told to keep silent, and with good reason back then, because sure. there were lots of, like I said, stigma existed. Uh, it, people were bullied. Mm-hmm. Um, it, people even lost jobs because of it. Uh, and, you know, back in the day of Rosemary... They even thought that it was contagious. Hmm. Um, you know, they they also thought the devil caused it, so that they didn't want to be around anybody because they didn't want the devil to inflict it on them. So there were lots of uh, myths surrounding the whole stigma of mental illness. So I think it was really good for me to write about my own experience with my my aunts and my uncle, um, who had taken his my uncle took his own life. But the, beyond that, I really think that this now is a call for help because, again, mental illness, mental health doesn't receive enough uh, attention. And it, it really needs to include all mental illnesses, you know, not only people who are developmentally challenged, but those who do suffer from depression. And they need to know that you know, they're not alone, first of all, and that they shouldn't just keep quiet because usually depressive people just want to curl into themselves yeah. and shut everyone out. I have a friend who suffers, and it's important that they don't because mm-hmm. that is when we have uh, occasions of suicide, and that also is just a horrible uh, national and, I believe, world problem. Here we are in the year 2015, and looking back over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen such a rise in violence when it comes to schools, bullying, mental illness, you know, the, the 
prescribing of Ritalin to children, the dumbing down, the, the, the theft of their creativeness as well as their youth. In your opinion, as an educator, what, what contributions to the negative side of the mental illness within the school system has the Internet brought? For example... Um, bu- electronic bullying, and and then oh, yeah. you know, and then taking a look at Columbine and, and other schools where there's been mass shootings. Well, I think it's it's so many issues are involved with this. First of all, we have the whole topic of bullying. Yes, and it seems like it's so much easier to do on the internet. Mm-hmm. You know, because it's faceless. You know, you don't have to be. You know, in a group, out loud, you know, doing it. Yeah. Uh, no, you know, it's harder to be caught. Mm-hmm. Uh, and second of all, I think that you know that whole crowd mentality, the mob mentality, mm-hmm. exists online, and you know, it's just it's frightening. And we're not only talking children, you know, adults too. Exactly. Uh, so uh, it's it's very disturbing to me. Uh, the other thing that's very disturbing is the proliferation of guns. Ooh, yeah. Now, I know that I will anger people who like their guns, mm-hmm. but I am saying that, you know, we need background checks. Yes. And we need solutions that deal with guns. We need locks. I think they should be giving free locks to families who have guns. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's just, it's such an, an horrible situation where. Everyone is allowed to get a gun. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the problem is is that the NRA owns so many politicians. And follow the money. Yeah. You know, follow the money and you'll find the answer. You know, I, so I, think I, that, I think that the founding fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, uh, you know, they, they, were, they, they weren't talking about the right to bear arms equaling uh, Uzis and, and all these... Ex- High tech exactly. weaponry that we have today, and right. I, I think that this has been lost in the translation. Now I'm a Canadian up here in Canada. You just can't walk into a store and buy a gun. You can't. Wonderful. You need to take a course even to buy a, a long a long gun or a rifle or a shotgun to get Excellent. a carrying permit for a concealed weapon is next to impossible. Yeah, I wish we had those yeah. laws here. I I I, I wish. Uh, so I hope that, you know, people can yeah. become vocal. Uh, I know that I I posted something on, on my Facebook site, mm-hmm. and most of the time when I post things, I get lots of people responding. And I posted something about gun control. No one responded. Everybody's really? afraid to touch that issue. I Everybody's re- afraid of it. I remember doing a show, sitting in for an afternoon talk show host when I was at uh, CKTB in St. Catharines. And we came into, somebody brought up the discussion of hunting. And I'm not a hunter. I can't see, you know, going into the bush and shooting an animal and then displaying it on a rooftop as you're driving home. You know, I, I remember saying that, in my opinion... A rifle is an extension of a man's penis because he has to prove his manhood. Right. You know, if you need a gun to prove you're better than somebody, you've got issues. Like, I was yeah. a cop for so many years, and I, I, if, if I drew my weapon out of my holster 12 times in the, in the total amount I was in the police force, uh, in, even as an investigator, that was a lot. Right. You know? Well, guns come out way too easily, yeah. and like you know, there's no reason that we need, uh, um, you know, military automatic weaponry. Yeah. If you're going to be hunting, you're not going to be using an AK-47. No. You know, uh, so there's just it's it's kind of ridiculous. All right. Why don't but, we why don't we why don't we form a pact that if you're going to go out to shoot an animal, let's arm the animals as well. <laughs> Well, I like that. Not yeah. a whole lot of people will agree with us, but <laughs> that makes sense to me. You know, you know what? Um, let me ask you this: you know, having having uh, talked to the Kennedy family and and being so close, have the Kennedys, with all their their wealth and their influence, done anything to help the mental 
uh, the mental crisis situation that's going on in America today? Uh, well, like I said, the um, Patrick Kennedy mm -hmm. uh, has, is really vocal about it. Right. And, you know, I'm, I know that some of the issues that Ted and Jack put forth, some of mental health was all-encompassing uh, in, in their legislation. So there are things that have been touched on, but I think that now we really need to do a big focus here. At, since the Kennedys have done so much good with uh, developmental disabilities, uh, now we need to focus on mental health, uh, mental, serious mental health issues. Hmm. What was the most shocking thing you found during your research? I think the most shocking for me was reading about how mental institutions back in the early 1900s treated their patients and what was accepted. And, you know, they were really... They were hell holes. I mean, they were just awful. It was the, the regular snake pit kind of thing mm -hmm. was, was absolutely true with many state institutions. And even, you know, Rosemary, when she first had her lobotomy, was placed in a private mental institution in upstate New York, and it was called Craig House. Right. And if it sounds familiar to you, it's because that um, we had... Some other famous people had stayed there, including um, um, Jane Fonda's mother. Unfortunately, she committed suicide there in, in the 50s. And before that, in the 30s, Zelda Fitzgerald stayed there. So we're having an institution for the wealthy, for the people who um, can talk and can, can fight for themselves. Well, Rosemary was there for nine years. Do you know why she left? No. There was evidence of sexual abuse. So even in the 40s, the lowest of the low worked there. People mm. with, um, you know, they, they could have, you know, created yeah. something, could have done bad things in another county, and they could just go right to the next county and get a job. Sounds like the Catholic and Church. So <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Yeah. So, you know, there was no database. So Joseph, as soon as, you know, they they told Joseph, mm -hmm. he said, well, we've got to get her out of there. And that's when he called his good friend, um, Cardinal Cushing, right. who knew about uh, St. Coletta. But I'm just saying, if this happened in an upstanding, well-known institution, you know what was going on in the state-run places where if you and I had been mentally ill back then, you know, we would have been thrown in one of these places. And, you know, unfortunately, it was, it was a hard situation. There were abusers there. Um, the, the, the institutions were overcrowded, ancient mm -hmm. fire traps. There was no money because there was no regard for the people who, who lived there. Uh, the patients were put to work slaving 12 hours a day. And those who were unable to work could be restrained through thick leather handcuffs or chains. Right. They were tied with bed sheets, God bless them. hands above their heads, and others were in straitjackets. And we're not talking for hours. We can talk weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. Now, if I lived there, I think I would be quite disturbed uh, about it, too. And so, um, you know, drugging patients to keep them calm was common. They would just, like you said about the drug therapy, yeah. they, they could be just out for, for months. Yeah. Uh, solitary confinement was usual. Patients were beaten. Mm -hmm. um, in one article I read, it was quite common for to have two bathtubs for 65 people. Oh, my God. One attendant said that coleslaw was thrown onto a table and residents had to grab it with their hands in order to eat. So we're talking about a pretty pretty disastrous situation and then of course the mentally ill mm -hmm. patients the numbers increased drastically after both world wars and they're doing so right now with yeah. our the gulf wars ptsd and the, you know 
PTSD. Yeah, exactly. And people were not know. You know, back then they didn't know what in the world PTSD yeah. was. Uh, and then people, of course, with with brain injuries mm-hmm. and trauma, were also put in the yeah. same place. So it was it was pretty horrific. And I think, like you said, with your the the young man Wayne calling in, yeah. some of this is still going on. What what can the public do? You know, I, I, I'm sorry if we've kind of drifted off from your book, but your book is is inspiring this conversation. Well, I hope that it does, and you know, it's fine that it drifts off from the book because that's one of the purposes. It's supposed to be to get people talking. Well, you've got and, us talking here. Yep, yeah, that's great. And you know, I think if you are a family member who has a loved one mm-hmm. in in a situation and who's in an institution, you know. Um, Hopefully that loved one can visit and kind of keep an eye out and try to find out what's going on. I mean, after all, we have an elder care um, issue the same way in our world. And when my dad had to be uh, placed in a nursing home because we were unable to care for him at that time, you better believe that I was there every day or two, uh, not only to visit him, but to look around and see how pa- other patients were being treated. So take an active role. Uh, and and if you don't have anyone who's mentally ill in your life, you know, you can be thankful that your family members are, are healthy. And you can also reach out to others. Like I said, you know, uh, volunteer. You can volunteer. Exactly. I know that my dad volunteered and raised money for mm-hmm. Uh, those with mental disabilities through his Knights of Columbus. You know, there are many organizations you can uh, volunteer for. Um, You can help out at a homeless pantry, like I said, and, you know, don't ignore the people on the street. Like I always tell the Exxon Nation, be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yes. Elizabeth. Write letters and and be vocal. Elizabeth, time has gone by so fast. I would love to have you back on in the near well, future you. so we can just you know so we can we can try to together do something to to raise the awareness and to get other people motivated to be part of this solution that desperately needs to be addressed it shouldn't be in the closet it should be right in front of mainstream at all times until we're able to to help these people out but until then I want to thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure yes, thank talking you to so you. Much. And uh, congratulations on a great book. By the way, I read the article on you in People's Magazine from September of this year. Great article. A great thank lady. You. And thank you so much for doing the great work that you're doing. And thank you for doing your great work in order to have someone feel comfortable enough to call you for help. It's my pleasure. Take care of yourself, Elizabeth. You too. Bye-bye. Now, Exo Nation, my guest this hour has been Elizabeth Kaler Pentakoff. She is the author of The Missing Kennedy. Now, her website, www.missingkennedy.com and www.lizbooks.com. Now, I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Every one of you listening can make a difference in someone's life. Every one of you. We have the power. So let's make Let's make positive changes in our lives. Let's be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Be nice to somebody. Open the door. Smile. Say hello. And if you can, give to a food bank. Throw a few extra bucks into the pot at Christmas time. Or just let people know you care. I'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue here in the X Zone. Don't go away. <laughs> 